Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as you'll see that I'm experiencing some technical difficulties with my video. I'm still trying to sort that out, so bear with me. And let me, there we go. It's been a while since we've joined ourselves, joined each other virtually. It's a little flashback to the pandemic, but uh, I appreciate everyone's patience as we sort this out. I'm gonna keep my video off. There we go. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. And for those of you who are alumni to our series, uh, thank you much, very much for joining us again this evening and uh, for your patience and switching it to virtual. It's actually, if anyone's thinking about what the pandemic quite have given us, it's certainly the, uh, the ability to be able to manage these types of uh, situations. We, can't, we have now have the opportunity to switch to a virtual environment rather than postponing and trying to find an alternative date. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, again, for those of you who joined us before in this in this way, uh, you're all pros at this now. But I will say that again, if you would like to engage in the chat, share where you're joining us from, ask any questions or comments for the speaker, please feel free to do so using the YouTube chat function. It will be monitored regularly throughout the presentation. You're also welcome to send your questions to marmus at marmuseum.ca. I will put that email address in the chat so you have that access. I'm so pleased to, to welcome our, our speaker this evening for the first time. It's, uh, this is our second presentation of our winter series this year, and um, we're, very, we're actually quite excited about the entire series this year. But this one is, is hits a little, gets a little closer to home by focusing a bit more on Kingston's history. So it's, it should be quite exciting. <coughs> Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land and the waterways located within the, within the Great Lakes catchment area have a long history predating the establishment of European settlements. The waterways in particular are to be acknowledged as the traditional trade routes of the Indigenous peoples, together providing a network of trade and travel routes essential to communities since time immemorial. The Marine Museum of the Great Lakes uh, at Kingston acknowledges the site it sits on and the water it interacts with to be the traditional territory, territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Six Nations, Iroquois Confederacy, of, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. We thank these nations for their care and stewardship over this land and water, and we are committed to sharing this stewardship moving forward. Our presentation this evening is uh, features Mr. Ian McCulloch, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, French history and uh, Bradstreet's raid uh, back in 1758. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ian McPherson McCulloch is a native of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Educated in Scotland and Switzerland, he holds an honors degree in journalism from Carleton University and a Master of War Studies and a Master of Defense Studies from the Royal Military College of Canada. It's my understanding as well that he served for a number of years as a Fort Henry guard, so I'm sure he'll share a little bit of information about that as well. He joined the Canadian Army in 1977 and retired from, the, from that post of uh, those positions in 20, June of 2014. Lieutenant Colonel McCulloch is now an independent military historian living in Kingston and specializes in the Seven Years' War in North America. Ian has published numerous articles on, on that subject in various international journals and magazines, as well as authoring and editing several military histories and memoirs, including the Sons of the Mountains, sorry, Sons of the Mountains, a history of the Highland Regiments in the French and Indian War, A Dangerous Service, the Journal of a Black Watch Officer in the French and Indian War, and British Light Infantry in the French and Indian War. Tonight, he talks to us about John Bradstreet's Raid of 1758, also the title of his new book, which was just published by the University of Oklahoma Press and is available for those of you who haven't purchased it already, certainly from Novel ID in Kingston and on any of the major online platforms. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ian McCulloch to the screen and uh, to take over the presentation this evening. Welcome, Ian. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks, uh, Michelle, for that, that introduction. Uh, thanks to the Maritime Museum uh, of the Great Lakes and uh, Kingston Yacht Club for co-hosting uh, the speaker series and, and inviting me to come and participate. I'll talk about an important piece of Kingston's military history uh, 
uh, in focusing on a year, one particular year uh, during the Seven Years' War in North America, probably more colloquially known as the French and Indian War in, uh, in North American histories. Um, so I'm going to dive right in to my presentation here and share it with you. And that's the cover of the book, inspired by um, a little known aspect of John Bradstreet's Raid of 1758 um, and a painting done by a good friend of mine, uh, Pete Rindlisbacher, a very good Marine artist, uh, but his connection to Kingston, similar to mine, he went to school here. I uh, got a PhD in psychology at Queens and is now probably the uh, foremost uh, marine artist in North America. And he kindly uh, agreed to do the cover for the book. Shows an aspect of the raid that John Bradstreet didn't want anyone to know about. More of that later. Now, I first encountered John Bradstreet as a young uh, infantry captain. I was sent on the six month course at Fort Frontenac shown here on the left. That's the front gate in. But in the foreground, we've got the uh, one of the demi bastions of the original Fort Frontenac, the, the fort that I call the underground fort in my book. And I've superimposed the present day street map on top of the foundations of the fort. So you can see the one that's exposed is uh, was where the old Plast Arms Road came in to the fort. And the other uh, exposed demi bastion of the fort is inside uh, inside Fort Frontenac. And there's a lot of folks in Kingston that don't know about this second piece of the fort that is on display, only if you've ever been to the Fort Frontenac officer's mess. So I used to walk past this uh, every day for six months, and I wondered about who this Bradstreet chap was. And so I read the plaque and found out that he had captured the fort in 1758 and uh, had been responsible for uh, innovating and developing a, uh, an organization known as the Bateau Service. And so I decided that uh, at some time in the future when I wasn't sort of, uh, sort of charging through the leaves with the bayonet in my teeth to come back and investigate uh, a little bit more closely about this chap that had captured the fort and who had given his name actually to the, the building that I was actually living in for six months. It was known as Bradstreet Block. So I'm gonna divide my 45 minute talk into six portions, six manageable portions. I'm, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about who was John Bradstreet for those of you that don't know who he was. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about the Badeau service, the, uh, the organization that he put into place. He was a mover and shaker, and this was essentially his baby. Thirdly, I'm gonna christen the ground. It's an old army term for, I'm gonna show you the geography of where the raid took place. I'm gonna talk a little bit about terrain. Fourthly, I'm gonna talk about a bit about the genesis of the raid, how it came to be, the raid itself and then uh, finish up with uh, some remarks uh, on the aftermath of the raid. Now here's the only known portrait of John Bradstreet or should I more properly say Jean-Baptiste Bradstreet. He was the son of an Acadian uh, mother, Agatha de la Tour. She was the granddaughter of the famous Charles de la Tour, the senior of, of Nova Scotia uh, in the Annapolis Royal region. Uh, before the, the, the British came in and captured it. His father was an officer in the 40th of foot, Hobson's uh, detachments in Halifax, Annapolis, Royal and Kenzo. His father died when he was quite young. He, um, he was sort of a regimental brat, grew up as a regimental volunteer. Uh, eventually his mother secured a commission for him as an ensign, along with his brother. And the two of them uh, were young ensigns in the 40th foot, um, he grew up speaking French fluently, uh, had cousins that were Acadian cousins that were serving in the Company Franche de la Marine over in Lewisburg. He uh, ran around in the woods as a kid, uh, spoke fluent Mi'kmaq, because Charles de la Tour had had several um, native uh, 
wives. So his mother had many stepsisters. And so he was quite uh, well attuned to Nova Scotia and, uh, and had a fairly uneventful career, except that he got heavily involved in smuggling just prior to the siege of Lewisburg in 1745 and got, uh, got in with uh, William Shirley, the governor of Massachusetts, and some of his cronies in, in devising a plan um, I think he provided some of the key intelligence for seizing and taking uh, Lewisburg in 1745, which the New Englanders basically did. And he, as a reward, got the lieutenant governorship of Newfoundland. But he remained in relative obscurity until the outbreak of the Seven Years' War. Here we see him in this portrait. He's about, he's 50 years old. The portrait we can we can uh, determine exactly when it was done. It was when he came back in 1764 from, you know, four months out on the lake. Lucky's down, everybody, he's down half a gallon. Lily white forehead, uh, bottom half of the face covered by his hat. Uh, he's wearing a very plain unadorned uniform, no gold on it. He's just come off the campaign trail. And what's unusual in portraits of these kind, that's the only known one of him, is that uh, usually commanders or successful commanders had uh, some picture of one of their feats or one of their great battles or a castle in the background. Here we see a completely unadorned uniform, unadorned background, 50 year old man um, in basically on the road to his death from cirrhosis of the liver. And he is just being raked over the coals for uh, making improper treaties with the Indians. So his career began a bit of a, a, a a downward arc at the time of this painting was done. Now, after the raid, he was, uh, he was only a lieutenant colonel on the raid. He decided that he wasn't getting the recognition from the success of the raid. So he decided to write an account and write it anonymously and say it was done by a volunteer on the raid. But uh, years later, it was discovered that it was word for word of his own journal, personal journal, that had been loaned to George Washington. And George Washington had copied down large tracts of, of John Bradstreet's journal. And it reveals that this account was actually written by Bradstreet as a piece of propaganda. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that account has been used by every historian for the last 200 years. You know, uh, even modern historians to follow Bradstreet's account word for word. And being a journalist, that doesn't, you know, coming from a, a journalism training, that didn't sort of ring true to me that you only use one source to talk about the history of an event to get to the bottom of the matter. So I went back to primary sources. I said the raid on Fort Frantic in 1758 in Cataraque is it it's it needs to be it needs to be examined technical glitch. we need to refresh the page uh sorry for the um technical glitch sorry try not not on not on your end not on ian's end your end susan okay because it, it is so progressing you're seeing, you're seeing three people okay sorry for the interruption <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah i'm using my uh, wife's computer everybody so um yeah, where was I? Yeah, so I went back to original sources, French sources. Uh, there was over 3,000 provincials on the raid. Some of them left letters, diaries, orderly books. Went back to all the primary source material and basically threw out that impartial account by Bradstreet and went back to the basics. And one of the first things I found, which really uh, put me off even looking at uh, Bradstreet's impartial account, was the fact that he left out a major part of the raid, which was that, uh, oh, my cat wants to join the presentation here, left out a, a very large uh, cutting out expedition to try and capture the two French warships that were anchored just outside Fort Frontenac and repelled at, at some expense of life to the provincials that took part in it. Bradstreet, when he wrote his official account, does not even mention it. That's when I, thought uh, something's fishy in that mark. These are the men that captured 
Fort Frontenac. These are the men that rode the bateaus up and rode the bateaus back. These are the men that caused a legendary fort to fall. And I wrote the book for them, basically, because their story has not been told. The focus has all been on what a great chap Bradstreet was. So the men from Massachusetts, the men from New Jersey, shown in the middle, the, the men from New York, the New York regiment dressed in green, their story is told in my book. Now, Bradstreet created a thing called the Bateau Service. And this was essentially done to provide essential supplies of men and material up and down the Mohawk River and the Wood Creek uh, Oneida Lake system. Basically a supply link between uh, Albany in upstate New York and Oswego. And I'll show you a map. I'll just talk a bit about the bateau first. Of course, French word. Um, eventually by the time of the revolution, the British Admiralty had a set plan for making them. But when they were being made during the Seven Years' War, they were, they were built according to locals, various designs for them. But essentially, the basic in a bateau was that it was flat bottomed, it didn't have a keel. It was flat bottom, and the bottom was made out of white oak, usually hardwood, because they had to be dragged over rills and rocks and, you know, portaged. And uh, also, sometimes they went uh, fully loaded over rocks and rails. So you had to have a strong bottom. The sides, however, to make the boat lighter were made out of pine, clinker built. Uh, usually, uh, they could range from 20 feet in length to 40, 50 feet in length, um, and depending on the length. Also, the sides of the boats could, heights of the sides would be adjusted depending on whether the boats were going to be used on a, a rough open lake like, like Lake Ontario or used on a more sheltered lake or inland river. Here's some reconstructed bateaus. Uh, there's a design there that I just threw there to show. That's a design for a 40 foot, or no, 45 foot long bateau. The bateaus that were being used basically to bring in the loyalists, to bring in supplies. There's a bateau, they, they could also be fitted with a sail. This is uh, basically a 12 man bateau, about 20 footer. It's got a small uh, paderado or a wall piece on the front for anti-personnel weapon. There's a, a bateau that has a slightly lower sides, more of an inland waterway type of bateau. Now I'm gonna christen the ground for you. You know, you can't have a presentation without a couple of maps in it. You know, I'm an army guy, so please uh, bear with me. Um, this is the North American theater of operations for the Seven Years' War. And of course, uh, we all know where we are. Some of the people joining us, uh, we're at Fort Frontenac. I probably can use my cursor here to, to hide. We're, we're here at Fort Frontenac right now. And Bradstreet and his men uh, for the raid were basically first assembled in Albany, which is just north up the Hudson River from uh, from New York. And then from there, the majority of them went north with Abercrombie's army to fight at Fort Carrion or Ticonderoga up here on uh, the bottom of Lake Champlain. When that terribly, went, and when things went terribly wrong at Ticonderoga, that's when Abercrombie started thinking about, hey, maybe I'll, I'll send some troops out to the west here and maybe, uh, maybe uh, cause some damage to the French in that direction. So we're drilling down now here. We're drilling down from the theater down into the actual area of operations. You can see Albany there. That was the, the assembly point for all the armies that were moving on Canada. Um, Schenectady up the Mohawk River, up to basically where the source of the Mohawk River is, the height of land in the middle of Northern New York State. And that height of land about four miles across you get into a completely different watershed, the watershed of the Moose River, um, Wood Creek, Moose River running down into the lake, also Wood Creek, Oneida Lake, uh, the Oneida, Onondaga River, Oswego River, all running down to Oswego and into Lake Ontario. This was all uh, 
So you basically have two watersheds. And right at that height of land, it's only about three miles between the two watersheds. That's where they built, or that's where Abercrombie decided he would build Fort Stanwix. And this is where the raid started. And this is where the raid ended in September of uh, 1758. They launched in six, on the 16th of August. They were back by the 3rd of September. Now, Bradstreet first came to the area of operations in 1755, as I said, at the invitation of his old boss at Lewisburg, uh, Governor William Shirley. And uh, at Oswego, they were building boats and his primary job as, a, as an officer of Shirley's regiment was getting the supplies and getting the boat building supplies and getting the troops and material to Oswego on Lake Ontario. This is Oswego on Lake Ontario. You see the army camps down on the left. You can see them building ships. The height of land just behind the portrait head of Rod Street, they were building a third new fort. But before any of the forts could be modified or the fort up on the height of land built, uh, the French struck in 1756, captured Oswego, destroyed, captured all the, the ships in the harbor, um, captured half of the regiments that were in garrison, which surrendered. And uh, it was a disaster. Brad, the only reason that Bradstreet missed it was he was uh, halfway between Albany and Oswego when it happened and there was nothing he could do about it. He was busy bringing the provisions to and from the fort. Now, 1758, we're, that's the year right in the middle of, of Seven Years' War. And here are the two commanders in theater. You got the theater commander general, James Abercrombie on the left, uh, recently the second in command, replacing Lord Loudon, who's recalled to London because of his uh, terrible uh, management of the previous year's campaign. Abercrombie is now in charge, probably not the best choice. And the governor general of New France on the right, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, and uh, uh, sort of tittered behind the back of the French regulars. They called him the Generalissimo because the strategy that he came up with sometimes was a bit suspect and not in keeping with uh, with the European traditions of war. He was Canadian born. He believed greatly in the uh, Company Franche de la Marine, the colonial Marines of the colony. He had served himself as a, uh, a young captain in the colonial Marines as his father who was a governor as well before him. Now in 1758, here's the story. Abercrombie has lost terribly at Ticonderoga in July. Meanwhile, Vaudreuil, is worried because Lewisburg has fallen to Amherst. And he thinks Amherst now will send troops to Abercrombie and uh, Abercrombie and Amherst reinforced will come against Montreal. The last thing he's thinking about is a raid on Fort Frontenac at Cataraqui. Here's the height of land between the Mohawk River and uh, Wood Creek, which runs down to down to the Lake Ontario. And this is where basically Bradstreet assembled his force of 3,000 men. Now, 5,000 men were sent to this area, ostensibly to build a fort where you can see Webb's camp on the map. Uh, 2,000 remained to build the fort, but 3,000 with bateaus and whaleboats uh, moved on down the river. Uh, with the intent of capturing Fort Frontenac, not capturing it, capture, but destroying it completely. And his orders were also to destroy the fleet harboring in behind the fort. And this was what he was given as a raiding force. 160 regulars, basically 160 men of the New York Independent Companies, nearly 2,500 uh, provincials drawn from New Jersey, Massachusetts and uh, New York and Rhode Island, the largest contingent coming from the New Yorkers. Artillery, regulars, 26 men. The, the two senior artillery commanders of Abercrombie's army were sent on this raid, a captain lieutenant and his lieutenant with eight pieces of ordnance shown at the bottom there. Rangers and Batomen were also American provincials. When I say Americans, I'm talking about colonists, I'm not talking about 
regulars of the British Army, so people that had been recruited locally. These batonmen, 276, were all mostly uh, from New York um, and were men that were well inured and well acquainted with the rivers and portaging and all of that. And Six Nation Warriors, let's not forget the indigenous contingent. All six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy went on this raid. Big deal, because if you've got all six nations represented on your raid, it means that any other indigenous forces encountering you are going to keep a wide berth, because basically just the presence of the Six Nation Warriors with Bradstreet's force sent a strong and clear message that this was a Haudenosaunee sanctioned event. Now, the other big intelligence indicator that the French, I think they picked up on it quite quite quickly is when, uh, when you have uh, artillery going with a raiding force and basically you have eight pieces of artillery going, it means that you need the artillery for something like battering down a stone fort. Now there's only two stone forts on Lake Ontario. You've got Fort Niagara and you got Fort Frontenac, the only two stone forts. And of course, Fort Niagara is in Seneca land, and the Seneca had not given approval for any uh, large forces of British forces to pass through their lands. However, there was no Haudenosaunee objection to Fort Frontenac being taken out, because as far as they were concerned, it had always been an encroachment on their traditional hunting lands, as mentioned by Michel at the outset. Now, the types of soldiers that were going on the raid were similar to the chap shown on the right. American uh, provincials, they cut down their hats, they cut their, the barrels shorter on their rifles. Everything on their uniforms were modified to, for the woodland fight. On the left, you've got a soldier, uh, a Marine of the Company Franche de la Marine, and there was 53 of these soldiers uh, manning the French garrison with 3,000 provincials coming against them. But they had some things that, uh, that helped them out in the defense of Fort Frontenac. First of all, the biggest fear that Bradstreet had in launching his raid of 3,000 men in open boats across Lake Ontario from south to north was the French fleet. Now, what you're seeing here is a French map that's been embellished with uh, drawings in the margins showing the English fleet that was captured at Oswego. And of the English fleet of the ships captured at Oswego, the Montcalm, the largest on the far left there, that was originally the London, the HMS London, and it became the Montcalm and was commanded at the siege and raid by the Sieur de la Bracarie, who was also a very good cartographer. And he's got some beautiful maps in the British Library, which you can access online. And those ships were at Fort Frontenac, and they were usually stored in the harbor or anchored in the harbor behind the fort. So if the causeway is coming across here, Basically, in the area where now the Place d'Arm uh, townhouses sit, that's all being that filled in. That was the original harbor of Fort Frontenac. And this map is the first British map of Fort Frontenac. Um, up until this point, the British had no idea of the cartography, the, the general lie of the land around uh, Cataraqui. So this is why the 42 Haudenosaunee that went with them, who were very familiar, with Frontenac could act as pilots and, and also show them the way. Now I mentioned that the fort had a garrison of colonial regulars, colonial Marines, 53 of them, including their officers. There was also 65 employees uh, of the King there. The King's uh, stores were there. There was a butcher, there was a cooper, there was a surgeon, there were bakers, there was ovens at the fort. Um, and of course, families, women and children. And most of these civilian employees lived in, in houses outside the fort, most of which had to be knocked down when they got um, wind of the British coming against them because they had to clear their fields of fire around the fort. 
I don't include the crews of the ships in the total of the French garrison because we don't know how many actually escaped, but basically all the gunners are, whether we're on board the two ships, the two operating ships during the siege, they all got away. They basically abandoned ship eventually and got away. Part of that, uh, the crew of the ships, part of the crew were some gunners that just sort of fortuitously showed up, shown here on the right. They were part of the uh, colonial marines. They got paid more than just the regular colonial marine soldier because they, they were specialists. And they showed up uh, on the day that uh, Bradstreet was actually coming up, on the third day that he was coming up. A ship arrives with uh, a detachment of gunners and their officer to collect stone for Fort Niagara. And of course, by this time, the commandant of Fort Frontenac knows that a large enemy force is coming in, immediately puts those gunners to work and getting the ships or the ships ready and the fort's guns ready. So just to rehash, um, the raid starts at Fort Stanwix here on that height of land between the two watersheds. It takes them a couple of days to get down, three days to get down to Oswego, because right here there's some falls that they basically have to get all the bateaus and whale boats unloaded out of the water around basically falls with a 20 foot drop and then back into the water and then down to Oswego. And then they launch from Oswego up the eastern, the lee shore of uh, Lake Ontario for the sailors in the audience who sail on Lake Ontario, you know, squalls can come up and this is a very rocky lee shore and you, you don't want to get caught on that when the wind comes up. So the bateaus hugged, didn't go out into the lake, they hugged the, the shore quite closely and they left uh, Oswego on the 22nd of August. By the 23rd, they were up at Sackett's Harbor, which the French call New York Bay. So they did that all in the first day. And then it took them two more days just to cover the last 30 miles between Sackett's Harbor and Cataraque. By the 24th, they were camped at Camp Vincent. By the 25th, they were in behind Simcoe Island and Garden Island waiting to cross over to uh, the mainland. So late on Friday, the 25th of August, Bradstreet and his 3,000 men cross over from Garden Island and land basically between where Murney Tower now stands here on this point of land and the water plant at the, the university and hospital, the university hospital down in this area here. So the Breakwater Bay, which I think some people in the Kingston Historical Society a good friend of mine wanted it to be called Bradstreet Bay to commemorate Bradstreet's landing here with his force, but they ended up calling it Breakwater Bay for some reason. Now, as I said before, they land five o'clock. It's almost last light as they're landing. They don't make a camp. They just uh, sleep on their arms that night. And Bradstreet and a force of about 200 men in whaleboats at B, take those uh, whale boats at last light and try and do a coup de main or a cutting out operation on the Vaudreuil, which is anchored here just off the fort to add its broadside to fort and prevent those 3000 men from coming down and getting in behind in this area. So uh, the French are waiting for them. The ships are, are, are the sh sails are fully fur fur furled. Uh, the wind is coming out of the north, north, northeast. The French fire a couple of uh, broadsides of grape shot. The uh, British American force is repelled and they go back with their tails between their legs back to the original landing place. Bradstreet doesn't make any mention of this whatsoever in any of his reports. You can find the report of all this in other accounts. Now, at, in the morning at sea, uh, they moved the artillery boats down to basically the location of the Kingston Yacht Club. For those Yacht Club members that are here, this is where the Bradstreet lands all his artillery and he moves some howitzers up onto uh, Mississauga Point where all those condo developments are now. 
this is showing the original uh, coastline. The coastline of Kingston changed completely now. When I went back, I used old maps as much as possible to try and recreate where everything was and when they did it and where they did it. Now you can see here at E, there's a, a line that goes, starts at the, the batteries and goes all the way up to a height of land overlooking the fort up in the area of basically the old brewery up there, uh, up where the armory is located uh, up in that area. And that's Bradstreet's route that he takes with his engineers. And later it's the route that he sends an, uh, a force of 500 men with two guns to set up a battery on the wood line overlooking the fort. The rest of the, his force, he's going to uh, leave a force back at the landing place to guard it against any attack, but he, another thousand men, he's gonna march them up uh, at last light on the Saturday night, and he's gonna put them in behind the old French breastworks. They're gonna dig uh, gun embrasures for the guns that they bring. And that way they're going to have uh, an expedient siege without, you know, digging uh, all the regular approach, approach trenches and what have you. He doesn't have a lot of ammunition either for those eight guns. I mean, pretty limited. I think he had about 40 cannonballs for each gun and, you know, the amount of powder to send them flying through the air. So that's the, that's what, that takes you up to basically the Saturday evening. The next day, the troops at A are still bombarding with that howitzer battery, the fort. Um, the troops have moved up now uh, on the early in the dark on the morning of Sunday. And they are, they all open fire. This battery opens fire first. That gives the signal for the battery down here to open fire. And they spend about two uh, hours just battering the ship and also firing at these two ships as well. The ship gets it particularly hot. And then at about just prior to nine o'clock, the British and the Americans see the two ships uh, unfurling their sails and starting to sail towards what they think is trying to escape out out through the entrance to the harbor, out through the outer harbor and out to the lake. But they never really get out because the wind is against them. And it's actually, there's not that much wind, but the wind is blowing southwest. The wind has changed. And so they can't get out. The Vaudreuil is raked by this battery here, and the two ships are abandoned by their crews, which is why I couldn't include them in the, the garrison. And the fort quickly then uh, puts up a red flag. And, Typically, they would put up the color of the, their opponent as an indication that they wanted to parley. And they surrender by nine o'clock on the Sunday. That night, Sunday night, uh, Bradstreet orders his forces to burn all of the ships except for the two biggest, which he loads all his prizes and plunder into. He loads all his artillery, all his wounded, and he puts his regulars on the two ships and he sends them back under his second in command to Oswego. And they, they don't get out the next day because the wind is not favorable. The two ships that were abandoned by the, the French have run aground. So first of all, they have to get those off of the mud on Bell Island or, or somewhere. You know, I did a lot of research on this, uh, but a lot of the accounts think that the ships went out, but they never went out of the harbor. And they went down the Cataraqui River and they either ran aground on Ile Au Pair or they ran aground somewhere over in Berryfield. And to get those ships off, they probably, and get them out of the mud, they probably had to throw a lot of the uh, uh, cannon overboard. So there's probably a lot of cannon in the mud there in the Cataraqui River. So of the ships, of the nine ships, seven are burnt and their, their hulks still sit at the bottom of Cataraqui Harbor. They excavated one a few years back. Um, so we're now into the aftermath of the raid. When the fort surrendered, the, the agreement was that uh, the prisoners 
there would be a one for one prisoner exchange. So at the same rank, and if it was a military prisoner, a military prisoner would be exchange of equal rank. Civilians, their occupations, uh, if, a, if a butcher had been captured, they would try and free uh, uh, a French prisoner of war that was a, was a, a butcher. So make a long story short, uh, coming up towards the end here. Um, one of the aftermaths of the raid was the sort of what I call the myth of no casualties. Where Bradstreet in his impartial account says that he only has one man, one man killed on the raid and 17 wounded. When in actual fact, in his impartial account, he talks about two of his men getting killed right at the outset of the raid. So, I mean, these inconsistencies in the account of, you know, what he's saying at the end of his account is only one guy killed when right at the beginning he says two guys are killed. And then he leaves out the entire cutting out expedition on the first night of the raid where in which I estimate there was between seven to eight casualties of the, uh, the 17 wounded total that he talks about. Um, did a lot of looking at that and what I could find out, though, was on the return the three, of the 3,000 men that returned, almost 1,000 of them uh, fall sick. From um, They're all exhausted because he's been driving them like a taskmaster for this entire time, afraid that, uh, you know, the French authorities would uh, send reinforcements and that he would be caught, you know, at Frontenac. He wanted to get in hit and run and get out as quickly as he could. And that took its toll on the 3,000 provincials that made, had made it happen. General Stanwix, who was in charge of building Fort Stanwix, wrote to the commander in chief that he only had half of the 5,600 men that he had sent left fit for duty. Uh, and they were dying, you read some of the order books, they were dying by the dozens every day. And, and it wasn't just, they were dying from typhus, they were dying from smallpox, they were dying from nervous exhaustion, but basically their constitutions had been so weakened by the raid that they were dying in droves. Now, there were some invaluable and important things that came out of the raid, despite this, um, terrible toll of men to achieve this accomplishment. The maps that were found on the two captured French ships were invaluable in charting and doing up maps for the British Army the following year in their uh, campaign against Niagara, and also invaluable uh, in charting the Thousand Islands and the approach for Amherst's army uh, for his descent down the St. Lawrence River um, to capture Montreal in 1760. So here you have a detail of one of the Sir de la Brocquerie's maps. And he had little inset maps showing each of the harbors, the soundings, the sandbars, the best places for anchorage, all to scale. Basically, the hard-won knowledge of French mariners on Lake Ontario was encapsulated on several maps that were found on board the ships. Here's a map that the British engineer did up after he had his hands on captured maps. He was then able to make a map of uh, Oswego and the coastline of Lake Ontario as far as Niagara for use by Sir William Johnson and General Prito the following year. Invaluable intelligence coup with this raid. Now, I mentioned that the Amherst Army uh, marched on Montreal in 1760. And certainly the uh, 1758 raid on Fort Frontenac was sort of a, a litmus test to test the new operational capability of the British Army to move through the wilderness at will using the waterways. Now, after the raid, um, the French never went back to Fort Frontenac. They stayed at this location, shown in this painting by Thomas Davies, a young gunner, considered to be one of the earliest artists, Canadian, uh, artists of Canada. 
And this shows a section of the St. Lawrence River whereupon we're witnessing the only uh, naval battle between French and English forces on the St. Lawrence River. And that's one of the two ships that Vaudreuil ordered built after the raid and after Bradstreet had destroyed the fleet. And the French had lost their capability to have a marine power on the lake. He ordered two ships built. And this is one of the two. And it's in the process of being captured by five British row galleys of Amherst's army as they move down. You can see Amherst's army just over here on the left making their way down the, the far side of the river while the row galleys take on the Utaways, which is then captured and turned into a British prize and used uh, in the siege of Fort La Vie. This is uh, Fort de la Presentation at Oswegatchie. Here's the Oswegatchie River. Very large, Christianized native settlement, predominantly Onondaga and Oneida. So, Another accomplishment was this of basically Bradstreet. We have to look at him not as a good commander of men, but as a good organizer, a bit of a workaholic, a man who, Lord Lund said, had to be rowed with a bridle at all times because he was that, uh, he was that sort of active. Uh, he's what we would have called in the army a thruster. Um, he was always in your face. And, and he, had an abrasive personality intended to rub people the wrong way, but uh, none of the commanders ever fired him because he was one of those essential people that you do need. And his sort of lack of social graces was put up with because he got things done. He was a mover. He was a shaker. And here's sort of the ultimate testament to his, uh, his legacy as an innovator and establishing a riverine capability for the British Army. Because here you see the British Army confidently heading down the St. Lawrence River in their bateaus, their weapons stacked in the front. You can see the native contingent there in one of their long lake canoes. They're shooting the rapids here at Long Sioux. Another sort of uh, undiscussed one, sort of, I just sort of stumbled upon this uh, aspect of the raid, which I, you know, which I discovered was um, interesting and sort of went down a bit of a rabbit hole on it. And in my book, I had a 5,000 word annex all about the prisoners of war that were freed in New France, the, the folks that had been in captivity for four or five years that were now all of a sudden freed because of this victory at Fort Frontenac. Perhaps the most famous person freed of the 138 British and American prisoners of war freed by this capitulation of, of Fort Frontenac was Susanna Johnson, perhaps the most famous captivity nerve ever written. I think it went through 22 printings um, a woman who her son and her two daughters and, they, and her husband, they were all captured, taken off to New France. The husband got uh, ransomed back first. Then she and her son came back as uh, prisoners in the exchange as uh, the Fort Frontenac raid. Her son didn't want to come back. He had basically become native and could only speak Abneki, couldn't speak uh, English anymore. Sylvanus Johnson and her new daughters had been put into convents and were being converted to Catholicism. And when news of that got back to Massachusetts, there was hell to pay, I tell you. And uh, recruiting was brisk for the following year. Now, for all of us, the aftermath of the raid, the history, the military history of Fort Frontenac really doesn't start up again until 1783 when the loyalists that uh, didn't want to go to Quebec or Nova Scotia or any of the other places they were offered said, well, how about Frontenac? How about Cataraqui? How about the Cataraqui townships? How about we go up into this area? And of course, the bateau becomes now the workhorse of peacetime in bringing families 
uh, to Kingston. In fact, uh, one of the predominant families that comes to Kingston during the American Revolution is a captain of Bateau's and his four sons, um, Jacob Jost Herkimer. He's given land at Lemoyne's Point, which was originally known as Herkimer's Nose. Land down where basically Bradstreet's encampment was, down where the hospital or the water plant are located. And I believe there's a Herkimer burial ground still down there too. But a typical loyalist family and their whole, their, their contribution as loyalists was that they continue to run bateau convoys, uh, bringing settlers in, bringing food and supplies in. They set up headquarters at Cataract Way along with the Cartwrights and other prominent families. Um, the oldest son, Lawrence, he runs the Kingston side of it and getting uh, supplies in from Montreal. Then the next brother, Nicholas Herkimer, who's buried uh, just up at uh, the Sydenham, uh, Sydenham Road United Church there by the Cataract Way Cemetery. He's buried up there, um, murdered in 1809. But he ran the bateau convoys from Kingston to Port Hope. And there, a younger brother, Jacob, Herkimer, you know, picked up the slack and ran Bateau convoys up to Rice Lake and uh, down to York. And I believe just sort of before I sign off here and hand the floor back to Michelle so you folks can ask questions, is that uh, I believe one of your speakers in a couple of weeks' time will be talking about the, uh, the sinking of the HMS Speedy. Well, one of the one of the one of the guys on board the Speedy that goes down is Nicholas Herkimer's younger brother Jacob, who's going down to York on the Speedy to act as an interpreter because he speaks fluent Ashinabe. So anyway, there you have it. The bateau, the bateau essentially is the workboat um, for the 18th century on the Great Lakes. It's it it it's used in war. It's used in peacetime and until sort of the advent of sailing schooners and, and which eventually do get built in, and steam, the bateau is the, the, the workhorse of the Great Lakes. So there you have it. Um, John Bradstreet's Raid, 1758, fairly short. Um, certainly uh, open to uh, answer any questions now. So back to you, Michelle. Thank you very much, Ian. Great presentation. Uh, very little known, uh, I guess, a period of history that I think locally that's um, not often talk, spoken about and talked about, probably because it requires a little, little bit more digging in terms of the research. So thank you so much for enlightening us this evening. For anyone who's uh, listening, please feel free to direct any questions via the YouTube chat. I am monitoring that. Or you can send your questions to our email address, marmus at marmuseum.ca. I have put that email address in the chat uh, for those of you who find it easier to send them by email. Um, a question that that, uh, that I had, and it's kind of one of those ones that you, you hear about, and I kind of wondered um, if you're able to, to provide a bit more clarity on it, um, given your the research that you've done. I've often heard that the original Fort Frontenac, um, the construction of it wasn't perhaps thought out the best, but it wasn't the best engineering feat and uh, was often left uh, weak, I guess. Is there, can you comment on the, the yeah. structural well, integrity of the fort, I guess is what I'm coming from? Well, the fort was built, um, wasn't built by French regular engineers. It was built by and you got to remember, too, that when the fort was originally built, it wasn't built along European lines. It was built as a fortified, basically a fortified uh, trading post. And the, the only thing that they had to withstand is musketry. And so the walls were above ground. I think if most folks here in Kingston have been up to old Fort Henry, which is just a redoubt, it's sunk down into the top, is dug down into the top of the hill, and there's no walls exposed for, for guns to fire at. There's a giant dry ditch around it, and there's certainly there are very high walls, but you can't batter those walls down. Whereas Fort Cataract Way, or Fort Cataract, it was originally called Fort Frontenac. It was renamed Fort Frontenac. It was abandoned during the Iroquois Wars 
um, and then Frontenac came back and it was reordered, rebuilt. The first fort was only half stone and half wood. The second stone was, or the second uh, fort was all stone all the way around. The fort was about, the, the fort walls were about two feet thick at the top. And then they sort of went down to about three foot at the bottom. And by 1758, after only about 20, 30 years, the fort was kind of rickety. And apparently one of the officers described it as a miserable shack. Um, another officer called, uh, said that it had been built in entirely the wrong place, that it didn't command anything, that it actually would have been better built out uh, where Fort Frederick is, out on the point of the land uh, at RMC there. And it has a better little a little harbor there. And, uh, you know, would have been better defensively as well. But, you know, the the there was corruption in those days too. So I'm sure the building materials that went into building the King's Fort um, they were skimped on. They said that when they fired the guns on the, on the ramparts of uh, Fort Frontenac, the, the entire fort would shake. And that you know the 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 or the lime or the cement between the stones would fall out like flour. So yeah, the fort was sited not really in a great place, and they had an opportunity to recite it, but they didn't. So the fort was dominated from high ground all around. So that's why Bradstreet's uh, two gun battery opening up from the heights up. Uh, up uh, towards the armory there, firing down onto the fort, uh, they could only take about an hour and a half of, of shelling just from those two guns. I mean, they they collapsed one of the one of the four demi bastions was uh, totally demolished. It, it collapsed with the guns on top of it. So yeah, um, did I answer your question? You definitely answered my question. It uh, gives me some food for thought when we were talking about our, our guided tour. We do we do talk a little bit about um, the French arrival and the fact that the, you know the fort the old fort was destroyed. Uh, British built a new fort. Uh, so yes, thank you very much. No, the, Brit the British never never built a fort there. No, well, I meant much. I meant, I meant, I meant yeah, much later, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the interesting that really interesting to me is that after the British had attacked the fort, destroyed it. Uh, basically, they didn't spike all the guns. Um, the French came back and they found that the, the, some of their guns were still operable. So they just uh, <laughs> recycled them and put them on the two new ships that they built to replace the, the two big ones that the, the British burned. And uh, their ovens were still operating. And they would send the uh, uh, people would come up river for a couple of days and use the oven still and bake bread and then take it back down to us with Gachi. But the French never reestablished themselves at Fort Frontenac. So 1758 basically was the end of the French regime in Kingston. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've had a few questions come in. Uh, the first one I have here, oh, second, it is from Dennis. Uh, the question is, what happened to the two ships taken back to Oswego? Yeah, good question. Um, basically, Bradstreet's orders, you know, at the tactical level were to destroy everything. And he kept the two biggest ships because they were already loaded. Because when the Marquis de Vaudreuil was coming from Niagara, it was bringing a haul of fur bales, as well as that detachment of gunners. It was bringing uh, some of the fur haul from the upper country, down from Fort Niagara, down for transshipment, you know, by voyagers and the bateau convoy up to Montreal. So they'd already loaded, it was already loaded with furs and pelts and what have you. And then the other ship was also loaded. It was loaded with guns and Indian trading goods and what have you, because it was, uh, it, when the Voyageroy was coming in, the Montcalm was going out to Niagara with a load of, uh, Indian goods and powder for the, the forts further beyond. So these two ships were the only two that were rigged of the nine ships. Um, basically, uh, Quebec uh, cronies had, of uh, Vaudreuil, had stripped the other ships of their rigging to outfit their own ships out of Quebec. Uh, 
and trading down to the Caribbean. Um, the ships were used by Bradstreet to transport his wounded, um, his artillery. You didn't have to take his artillery back in special bateaus. You could just put them on board the you can even put the special bateaus for the, uh, the guns on. Um, the regulars and gunpowder and a lot of plunder went on the two ships. The two ships were unloaded on Oswego. And then as soon as Bradstreet got back, he ordered them both burned. And so the last two ships on Lake Ontario were burned. Now, meanwhile, back at headquarters, <laughs> Abercrombie had been pondering on his original orders to Bradstreet. He wrote a letter to Bradstreet while Bradstreet was sort of just getting back to Oswego and had these two ships and was, and uh, Bradstreet uh, never got the letter in time, but Abercrombie wrote him and said, oh, I've been thinking maybe we should keep those two ships because they give us operational control of the lakes. We'll have the only two warships on the lake. Uh, we don't have to build them from scratch and we could, you know, keep them cruising on the lake there. And uh, so I, I, you know, Bradstreet's reaction is unrecorded. He must have been furious because, you know, he he later claimed in his impartial account that he had said that this should happen all along, that he should go and capture Fort Niagara, ignoring the fact that diplomatically that was impossible because, you know, uh, crossing Haudenosaunee land had not been negotiated for Fort Niagara. So the two ships were burned and they were burned just off of Oswego Harbor. And I'm sure they're still there. And, you know, if you're a diver, I'm sure uh, diving clubs down there have found at least portions of portions of those ships. So there you have it. The, those two ships could have made a difference. They could have probably taken post at Oswego. Instead, the year was prolonged, but the war was prolonged another year because then they had to sort of do their tactical step the next summer and take post at Oswego to launch their uh, expedition against Niagara. And then, of course, they use Oswego again as a launching pad for uh, Amherst's army in 1760 uh, going down the lake. Hmm. I have a follow up question, but I'm going to get, uh, I have a few more here. Um, yeah. The, okay, so this question from uh, David Moore, who says, a great presentation, uh, we'll buy your book. Uh, he's interested in, to, in why you don't consider the assault on Ticonderoga uh, before Fort, Fort Frontenac as, as, as an example of how much amphibious, of such amphibious efforts, sorry. The, why you don't consider the assault on Ticonderoga before Fort Frontenac an example of such amphibious efforts? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm talking about a raid. I'm not talking about an army uh, moving uh, into position so that they can then engage the French army, the, you know, in a classical European style uh, army confrontation. This was a raid. This was sort of a hit and run, a lightning strike, an amphibious strike over river and in up a lake. Uh, the progression of uh, Abercrombie's army, 15,000 men, was a very slow, ponderous armada of boats. They basically covered the entire, entirety of Lake George uh, from one side of the lake to the other, and they just sort of moved up the lake. There really wasn't much in terms of uh, portaging or uh, uh, open lake navigation that type of thing. So I, I don't consider, yeah, armies moving down lakes in order to engage another army. They are riverine operations as well. Um, but in this case, I was talking about the raid, not about uh, the movement of Abercrombie's army. And of course, you know, you can make an argument that the movement of Amherst's army down the St. Lawrence River, same thing. But that, Essentially, it's riverine operations, by definition. Great. Good question. <laughs> uh, wait, I'd love to talk about Ticonderoga. I mean, I've written several articles and books about Ticonderoga. That's one of my babies. I can talk about that all day. But 
this raid that happened after Ticonderoga is just glossed over in the history books. And the glossing over usually is one or two, three lines taken right out of in, the impartial account by our friend John Bradstreet. And I figured it was time to tell the story from the perspective of other participants, especially their opponents. The French went through a lot of French documents, um, had help from several French Canadian friends, friends uh, translating some of the very archaic French that was used. Of course, at one of the aftermaths of the raid is that the commandant, uh, the old Serpian de Noyen, um, the 68-year-old uh, commandant is thrown to the wolves by uh, Governor Vaudreuil, you know, and is told, despite the fact that Payen de Noyen was sort of, he and his cousin were well attuned with what was going on in terms of what the Onondaga told them, because they were blood brothers of the Onondaga. And basically two, three weeks before the raid, his cousin come and, comes and warns him, having just come back from Oswego and, and meeting with some Seneca down there uh, and says, you know, there's a large force at Fort Bull, which is what the French called Stanwix. And they're coming against a fort and they have artillery with them. And you know, they knew it was a nagger. So by default, it was front nag. So he sends a letter when his cousin warns and he sends a letter off to Vadrian and says, hey, they're coming. Uh, send me reinforcements. I need, I need help. And, and Vaudreuil turns to one of his officers and says, what makes this officer so afraid? Because he's so confident in his um, assumptions that the British, without, without uh, a base at Oswego, cannot mount a major operation. And so he accepts risk. He accepts risk in that part that theater of operations and very lucky that uh, they didn't know the british didn't know that niagara only had about 40 guys you know they had less guys in it than uh, fort frontenac did and could have fallen quite easily especially if bradstreet had used the two captured french ships flown french covers and colors and sailed them right up to the you know the king's wharf at niagara and taken the fort by a coup de main but there you have it, you know, make a good novel. <laughs> we'll have to have you back for a uh, Takataroga episode. Well, Niagara, you know, Niagara. Or the, Niagara, that's you. Niagara is the next big amphibious uh, expedition. And that involves Sir William Johnson. Of course, Sir William Johnson, the famous uh, frontier baronet, you know, of the Iroquois, of the Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, he's the hero of Niagara. And... Uh, helped in no small part by what was done at Frontenac and certainly all the young officers that go with Bradstreet on his raid are all back again the following year. This alumni of folks now that have this important riverine operational knowledge and these guys end up being the colonels and the generals during the American Revolution in the Northern Department. Folks like Marinus Ouellette, uh, Goose Van Shake, one of the surgeon mates on the raid, uh, becomes the director general of hospitals for George Washington. You know, he, after the raid, he goes and studies to become a doctor. Um, Philip John Schuyler ends up being the major general commanding the Northern Department, a uh, confident mentor, mentored by John Bradstreet. So, the raid has this uh, establishes what I would call a corpus of, of operational knowledge in New Yorkers, uh, New York uh, officers. They they almost, as a result of their sort of five years service during the French and Indian War, become semi professional, semi professional officers. Well, sort of something akin to America's National Guard where they, they are more than just a militia, just a, more than just a rabble in arms. These guys know their stuff. Well, that uh, actually segues perfectly into the next question, which is uh, any feel for how many of the provincials became loyalists and emigrated to Upper Canada after 76? I mean, some of the ones you're talking about here, uh, your by knowledge are more the American revolutionaries. Um, commenting on the 
the aspect of the loyalists? Well, when I was writing my book, I, I thought, wouldn't it be kind of cool if I could find a guy that was on the front knack raid and uh, and now here he is arriving on a boat in 1783, looking at the fort, you know, in ruins and, uh, you know, the, the new buildings going up. They took a lot of the, took apart a lot of the wooden buildings on Carlton Island and where the British base was, wasn't at Kingston. And they moved them from Carlton Island to, uh, to Kingston and reassemble them there. So all, all the houses that you see in that famous uh, painting of Kingston in 1783, what you see is all those houses that have been taken apart and then reassembled in Kingston, sort of instant, instant town uh, sprouts up around uh, the ruins of the fort. Anyhow, um, there you have it. Thank you. Uh, any, if there's any last questions, please send them in. I do have one more here. That, sorry, that question was from uh, Rob, who was joining us online. Uh, there is what I believe to be a replica bateau adjacent to the waterfront historic site in Bath. Uh, who, uh, this is from Maurice, who says, uh, well worth taking a look at, but it is deteriorating, exposed to the weather. Any comments on the, that particular replica? There's a replica of a bateau? Yeah, adjacent to the waterfront historic site in Bath. Uh, is it just rotting away now? That's what it sounds of it, yes. Yeah. Uh, interesting. As part of my research, uh, they have uh, um, typically, uh, during the winter, what they would do with bateaus, uh, they wouldn't store them. Uh, they wouldn't store them above ground. They would sink them with stones under the water for the winter. And then the water would freeze over the top of the bateaus. And then the next next spring for the next campaign, this is down in Lake George, they would they would uh, they would retrieve their bateaus and the boat the bateaus would still be good. Um, of course, after the last cam campaigns of the Seven Years' War, they never went back and got a lot of the bateaus. So a lot of underwater archaeologists have been finding intact. Bateau. So if you just uh, Google Bateau Lake George, you should, uh, they've got, uh, there's actually a couple of books on it now showing actually authentic, re re not just replicas, but the original bateaus that are remarkably well preserved in the waters of Lake Champlain and, and Lake George, where they were used on a daily basis. Hi. Um, I think I've lost them. No, you're still there. Okay. I guess Michelle's away from <clears throat> away from the computer. Oh, sorry. No, I thought I didn't realize that I hadn't unmuted myself. Sorry about that. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, I was just no. going to say that apparently <laughs> the comment is that there's still enough of the bateau um, worth that to make it worth uh, a visit out to Bath. Okay. Yeah. Well, if anyone's looking for anything to do this weekend. It's always fun to see bateaus because they're always different. There's always, uh, you know, they differ in length, they differ in shape, uh, but essentially they, they were all built for the same purpose. And uh, what's fun is to see some of the specialty bateaus that were built for you know, to accommodate uh, carrying artillery, you know, just making sure uh, everything was in the right place. One of those uh, bateaus that Bradstreet brings when his artillery piece in, um, they're bringing it down the Oswego Falls. They, for the actual drop of the falls, they would bring the bateaus down on uh, logs. They would roll them down on logs. That way they didn't have to unload them completely to get them down below the falls. And then they would refloat the boats with uh, all, all their kits still in it. They put a guy in the front to hit the water with a paddle before they put it in. And then th three or four boatmen would jump in with it and then take it down through two or three kilometers of white water 
And then the original occupants of the bateau would pick up their bateau. And if it needed uh, any repairs, like one or two holes in it, and it needed caulking, would go to an area where they were re caulking the boats and what have you, reloading them and what have you. But uh, it, that was the biggest obstacle on the entire trip. Going and coming back from Kingston was Oswego Falls. Not there anymore, hydroelectric or something like that. But it's a very interesting, uh, It most of the train, except for Oswego Falls and parts of uh, Oswego itself, is still pretty much the same as it was. Uh, at the time of the raid. So you can, you know, you can canoe the route. If you so everyone's like summer plans have been sorted out. Pack yourself up and go exploring and f yeah. map out the uh, the terrain after we've, now that it's changed, well, compare, comparing it to what you were seeing in the maps is not seeing what you're seeing what it is. Yeah, no, you'll see bateaus every now and then when they have a loyalist days, you'll see three or four bateaus of different sizes and shapes, you know, with reenactors in them reenacting it's a it's a it's a fun thing to reenact is the the bateaus um you know because you can mess around in boats like in wind in the willows okay. well thank you very much ian if there's anyone who, if there's any questions remaining in the audience please feel free to send them by email to marmus at marmuseum.ca and i will make sure they get passed along to our um that's it to ian and um I just have a couple of final thoughts. Um, I'd just like to say thank you again, Ian, for joining us this evening and for everyone for making the switch to virtual this evening. Uh, I hope everyone's staying well and staying safe indoors. Uh, our next presentation is on the 8th of February uh, with uh, Dr. Kristen Lovett of Queen's University. The presentation is Lake Superior, Our Helper, Stories from Butch Shawana, Anishinaabe Fisheries. Uh, we're getting a bit more into uh, talking about indigenous food sovereignty uh, and of course about around the Great Lakes so it should be an interesting conversation as well. If you haven't already signed up please, please feel free to do so. We do have uh, four more presentations left in our series and uh, should, should be a really good well-rounded uh, series by the end of it. Ian thank you again so much for joining us it was a pleasure to welcome you. And oh, it's my pleasure. You if you haven't purchased your uh, his book yet, please do so, uh, Novel Idea, or of course anywhere online. And uh, otherwise, I wish everyone well, a safe evening, and we'll see you on the 8th of February. Thank you very much. All right, we're ended.